Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome all of you to this amazing webinar that we are going to start. My name is Vivian Calice Silva. I'm a nephrologist from Brazil, and I'm, I am a member of the ISN Emerging Leader Programs Cohort and also a member of the ISN Education Working Group. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our speakers of today's webinar. First, I would like to know that at the end of the talks, we are going to have a question and answer sessions, and the questions can be typed under the question session in this platform. So we are going to have today uh, Dr. Frederick Fink Finkenstein. He is a clinical professor of medicine at the Yale University of Med Medical School in New Haven, United States, and he has been much involved in many initiatives related to patient-centered care, development of peritoneal diagnosis in low income lower income countries, such as the Saving Young Life Lives Program, which is currently deputy chair, and is also a member of the I3C, the International Consortium of CKDU Collaborators Network from ISN. After him, we are going to have Dr. Brad Cullis speaking. He is nephrologist intensive care specialist based on Hilton, South Africa, and he also has been very much involved in many activities to develop peritoneal dialysis access, especially in low and middle income countries. He's chair of Saving Young Lives program and also member of the ISN Dialysis Working Group. Uh, both of, of them are authors of the new ISPD guidelines for PD in acute kidney injury, and they are going to talk about this today with us. Please, please Fred, is with you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, everyone, for joining us in this very interesting and important conference. Um, we're going to talk today about peritoneal dialysis to treat acute kidney injury. Is this feasible with a particular focus on low- and middle-income countries? So there was a in, real interest in um, acute kidney injury um, developed in the about 2012, 2013, with a series of publications and the ISN initiative, Zero by 25 initiative that was introduced by Giuseppe Ramuzmi when he was president of the ISN in 2013. And the reason for that is shown on, on the next couple of slides. First, acute kidney injury contributes to worldwide mortality with an estimate of about 1.7 million deaths per year. This was estimated actually in 2013 in an important paper by Andy Wilmington and Kidney International. And as you can see, 1.4 million of these deaths occurred in low and middle income countries. Now what's important about this is that there's an increasing frequency of acute kidney injury. And in this paper published in 2013 in Jason, um, this, this paper emphasized that AKI was really increasing, and this was looking at dialysis requiring AKI, not simply an increase in the creatinine level. If you look on the left-hand side, it shows you the population incidence rate for AKI. But if you look at the right-hand panel, which looked at it by age, the incidence of AKI was much higher in the older populations over 65 and 75, as we all know, the population is aging. So the incidence of dialysis requiring AKI now is increasing dramatically and will continue to increase over the next decade. So developing strategies to manage AKI then is really critically important. And it was this information, again, as I mentioned, that stimulated Giuseppe Ramuzzi when he was president of the ISN in Hong Kong to announce the ISN Zero by 25 initiative which was really, um, you know, something that was really not, you know, something, well, let me back, the goal was to eliminate preventable deaths from acute kidney injury worldwide by 2025, with a focus on low, low middle income countries. Obviously, this wasn't gonna happen completely by 2025, but it stimulated an interest in developing globally applicable strategies to admit a timely diagnosis of AKI and provide access to renal replacement therapy for patients with potentially reversible acute kidney injury. So the first question we had to answer was from, from the peritoneal dialysis standpoint was, is PD an acceptable treatment for AKI? And the answer to that is clearly yes. And that's based on several studies of which I'll show you two of them. So this important study by Gabriela Ponce Gabriel, um, which was published in Kidney International in 2008, was a randomized trial comparing mortality rates with high volume peritoneal dialysis and daily hemodialysis, in which 154 patients were eligible and 75 were randomized to the two groups. 
Um, and it was a very well done study, um, very balanced between the two groups. And importantly, these were patients really in intensive care units in Brazil. Um, and the patients were similar to one would see um, in any intensive care unit. And the mortality rates are shown on the upper right-hand panel. And you can see there was no difference in the mortality rate in the two groups. But what's important is what's shown in table two on the bottom right-hand panel. When we look at the outcomes, the duration of treatment was significantly shorter in the patients he's receiving perineal dialysis. And the resolution of acute kidney injury occurred more rapidly. Again, the suggestion here is that the daily hemodialysis with hemodialysis shifts in some way potentiates the kidney injury, and there is actually potentially advantages to using perineal dialysis compared to the frequent hemodialysis in this Brazilian study. And this was confirmed by a study from Saudi Arabia published by Abdal al Hawesh in Therapeutic Ephoresis. Um, and this study, they compared acute PD with CVVHD in critically ill patients in Dhamam, Saudi Arabia. And the, the outcome is shown on the graph on the right, which showed significantly a better survival rate for patients receiving PD than those receiving CVVHD. And as in the Brazilian study, there was a shorter duration of acute kidney injury in the patients receiving PD. And again, this was a large study with 75 patients in each group. So the next question would be, is PD an acceptable treatment for AKI in lower resource countries? And the answer to that is clearly yes. And I'll show you just studies from India, Nigeria, and Sudan that have addressed this question, which stresses the feasibility and practicality of using PD in acute kidney injury in low resource countries. The advantage of PD is obvious in some ways that you, you, you don't need machines, you don't need electricity, you don't need large volumes of water. All you need is a perineal catheter and bags of PD solution. So the studies, let me just mention them briefly here. When I visited Madras, this was in about 2014, um, as a visiting professor, they uh, made rounds at Madras General Hospital they use PD routinely to treat patients with AKI. They did a thousand treatments a year with acute kidney injury. The team is shown in the photo on the right-hand side of the slide. And they reported excellent outcomes. And when you come in, there's a large picture in the entrance of the ward of Dimitri Royopoulos, who, as you know, was the really founder of CAPD and one of the big advocates of perineal dialysis. But studies from Nigeria, also published in 2012 and 2014 in PDI, reported 44 children with AKI who were treated with PD with adapted catheters, not with parallel catheters, but catheters that were used for other purposes that were then utilized for PD, and they reported a 60% survival rate. And another important paper published from the Sudan by Abdul Rahim, also published in PDI in 2014, they reported on 659 children with AKI who needed renal replacement therapy. And as you can see on the graph on the right-hand side, the majority of these were treated with perineal dialysis. And they had outcomes which were really very good, a 70% survival rate, 30% death rate. So again, they were routinely using PD to manage AKI um, in the studies in Sudan as well. And we did a systematic review of the outcomes of PD compared to extracorporeal therapies. And this was published in 2013. We looked at eight cohort studies shown on the top of the graph at the right and four randomized trials. And when you look at the, um, the line, which is in the red lines, you can see there's really no difference in the outcomes in either the cohort studies or the randomized trials, suggesting that PD provides a very acceptable um, treatment for acute kidney injury, um, which is as good as any of the extracorporeal therapies being CBVHD or um, acute hemodialysis. So all of this data together was what really brought together um, the Saving Young Lives project. Um, so this was originally funded by the five-year grant from the Kaplan Foundation with four organizations participating, the ISN, EPNA, ISPD, and EuroPD which they provided educational programs and support. And initially, the Sustainable Kidney Care Foundation um, provided supplies to help jumpstart programs in lower resource countries. But the research grant providing for supplies has run out now, and the program is now supported with funds from the four international organizations who sponsor educational advocacy programs 
in low middle income countries for PD treatment for patients with acute kidney injury. Now, the original pilot project that gave rise to the Saving All Lives project was organized in the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center in Moshe. And this was a grant from Baxter given to the ISN to see if we could reasonably set up acute kidney injury, renal replacement therapy in a low resource center. And the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center was, was selected because there was a good hospital there, a good team that was interested in developing the project. And importantly, there was no dialysis in the region anywhere at that time. So that's the northern part of Tanzania as shown on the map on the right hand side. So this program was started and it was the key person organizing was Kijiro Kalanzo, who hopefully will join us on this webinar. And he at the time was a trainee in Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center um, and really developed this program and now he's chair of medicine at this wonderful institution. But over the initial two years of the project, they were able to dialyze 26 patients, 18 of whom left the hospital with recovery of renal function. Five patients died in hospital. The average duration of PD therapy was 11.4 days. And this data was published in PDI in 2012. And what's interesting, this data really became the, the data which has been reproduced in almost all centers where we set up PD programs for AKI under the um, Saving Your Lives project. So where is the Saving Lives Project now? This program has trained 363 doctors from 29 countries. The number of patients treated is well over 600. We don't have actual data on all the patients. We don't know all the patients who are treated, but it's well over 600 patients treated. The focus has been on children. The mean age has been 9.5. The mean dialysis duration was 10.6 days, as it was in Moshi, and the mortality rate in hospitals, about 25%, very similar to what it was in Moshi as well. Importantly, we started using commercial solutions, but in recent years, because we don't have, we can't provide free supplies, many of the solutions now are made on site. And importantly, there's no difference in infection rates of outcomes in three separate publications by Palmer, McCullough, and McCoy, and that data is from Cameroon, um, from South Africa, and from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We've run formal training courses and programs primarily in South Africa, but more recently in India and Myanmar. And importantly, we rely on trained teams to work with others in the region and get other individuals trained to expand the utilization of PD. So what lessons have we learned over this? The lessons we learned are the following. To develop the program, we need to identify an on-site champion. We meet, need to make a long-term commitment and develop a close collaboration with teams at the site. We need to discuss and understand the support that is needed, lab support, nursing training, ongoing education programs of physicians, nurses, and patients. We need to try to recognize the problems and barriers. We need to partner with existing providers such as academic institutions, global health programs, NGOs. We need to understand the cultural, economic, and political context. And lastly, work with the government to garner support if that can be arranged. But there are challenges as we look to the future. Making the program sustainable has proved to be an issue. Again, we cannot provide for supplies. We can provide education and training. So the ongoing provision of donated supplies is not possible. The number of patients identified is lower than we anticipated. So we need to explore innovative ways to increase the awareness of AKI and expand educational programs in telemedicine. We need to educate and train regional and district health centers about AKI and the readily availability of PD to manage patients who need kidney replacement therapy. And the most recent publication from the Saving Young Lives Project was that from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which was published in PDI in 2020. And this was started by one physician and one nurse who were trained in the local production of PD solution and bedside catheter insertion in Benin Republic with Francis Lalia, who Francis was one of the initial people involved with the Saving Young Lives Project and developed a fabulous program in Benin. This program was jointly sponsored by the Flemish Inter-University Council team from um, Belgium and the Saving Your Lives Project. And over the course of the year, they treated 32 children with AKI and had a mortality rate of 20%. And importantly, in, this, in the DRC project, Benin was used as the training site. 
It was a close collaboration with an on-site team and academic center, saving our lives. And there was local training that the two resource members have in turn trained three other pediatric residents and five nurses in the use of PD for AKI. And I want to conclude with my last slide with just emphasizing that PD is being used for AKI to treat COVID. So COVID is a problem, I guess, globally. And the AKI occurs frequently in patients who are hospitalized with COVID. And PD is an acceptable treatment for AKI. And this was published from the um, King's College in London and in the International Reports earlier this year on 44 patients who were selected and 37 patients were treated with PD um, with very excellent outcomes without any detrimental effect on the parameters of ventilation and no increase in infection risk. So again, it's important to keep in mind that as COVID infections um, continue and AKI develops, PD can be used very successfully to manage these patients. So why don't I stop here and turn this over to Brett, who's gonna talk about the new guidelines for PD for AKI, and then hopefully we can answer questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, and thank you all for joining us on this webinar. I'm gonna talk now about the ISPD guidelines um, that we've written, and I'm, I'm gonna be talking on behalf of uh, the authors that, that wrote it with us. Um, and I'd like to thank them for, for all the hard work in putting these together. And you'll see the authors are all people who've got a lot of experience in doing PD for AKI, both in the adult and the pediatric world, as well as um, in higher and low income countries. So we've got a, a, a breadth of um, experience um, that went into these guidelines. Now, these are the second set of guidelines that we, we did. We, the first set of guidelines were in 2015, um, and these guidelines were an update looking at the latest um, data that was out there um, and updated the original guidelines uh, that we produced. So as Fred says, you know, this AKI is a, is a major problem um, with 1.4 million people dying per year um, from AKI and the majority in, in developing or low middle income countries. So we need to think about how we're going to dialyze these patients. And there were two studies done by the Zero by 25 initiative. The first was the, um, the global snapshot and it showed that dialysis was required in about 22% of the patients that had AKI. And of those, 8% of patients had indications for dialysis but didn't actually receive it. Now, that was the same split between high income countries and low middle income countries in terms of the percentage. But what was important was that in the low middle income countries, this was predominantly because there was a lack of resources and patients couldn't afford the out of pocket expenses. And the same was found in the Zero by 25 study, which was just recently published. And this was the pilot study. And you can see around 50% of patients who had a dialysis indication. And these were in, in low middle income countries, Nepal, Bolivia, and, and Malawi. 50% of patients actually didn't get dialysis due to resource limitations. So this is where PD really comes to the fore. It's something which can be done in a low resource setting. Um, it is highly cost effective. Um, and so is, is something that we should be looking for uh, using uh, predominantly in, in our low resource settings. But PD has been used for many, many years. In 1945 was the first time a patient was treated for AKI um, and their life was saved. And since then, there were a number of problems with fluid overload. Um, the patients um, had catheters that, that were a major problem, but these were improved on and PD became a, a a, a very effective form of treatment. But then along came CRRT, and in most ICUs and acute kidney injury um, centers, CRRT took over the role of acute PD. And you can see the two studies at the bottom, the one on the left from Canada, the other from the BEST study, um, showing that CRRT really took over acute PD. And this wasn't because acute PD wasn't any good, it was just that CRRT, I believe, was more sexy. And it's much easier for a, an anaesthetist, especially uh, or intensivist, um, to have a, a, a machine that you can dial in a number, whereas PD is slightly more nuanced in terms of how you, how you prescribe it. But what we've seen is that we've actually come full circle, as Fred has just shown you. And with the COVID pandemic, suddenly PD was needed again. And we've got papers coming out of the UK and the US and many other places where acute PD is being used to treat these patients with AKI in high income, high resource to intensive care units with good outcomes. So let's have a look at the guidelines. Now, Fred 
has talked has told you very much why we feel that acute PD is suitable for treating AKI, but we wanted to look at the evidence base for this. And our guidelines use the grade criteria, so the evidence um, is graded, and the recommendations are either a strong recommendation um, or a weak recommendation being one or two. We also ask the question is what is the optimal access and fluid delivery for PD and AKI? Which fluids should we use and what do we do when these aren't available? How do we dose PD for AKI? And then also how do we troubleshoot the complications? And what was important is that we knew that these patients were going to be both in high income countries as well as poorly resourced countries. And sometimes doing what is not the optimal may still save lives. And so we have two standards and you'll see that some of the recommendations have a, an optimal and that's what we should be striving for as, as optimal therapy. And then we also have the minimum standard. And this is what we feel is safe, but is likely to save lives if you don't have any other option available. So in 2015 and 2020, we both, we asked that question twice, is PD a suitable um, modality for treating AKI in adults? And we got a 1B recommendation in both, um, both of these. However, there was more evidence for our most recent guidelines, um, but it's still a 1B recommendation due to the single center nature of the studies. And Fred's showing you this um, systematic review that they did, again showing cohort studies and randomized studies showing no benefit um, of PD over, or extracorporeal therapy over PD. And Daniela Ponce's paper showing no difference in survival compared to daily hemodialysis and PD. And Abdullah Alwaysh's study from um, Saudi Arabia showing that when they use tidal PD compared to CVVHDF, where they achieved the optimal treatment of 23 moles per kilo per hour, there was no difference in mortality between the two groups. So certainly no evidence of inferiority of acute PD. Sometimes people say, well, can we, you know, can we correlate patients in ICU? You know, the patient with, a, with acute kidney injury is in ICU, or is it suitable for them? Well, the three large studies were actually done in patients in ICU. They were critically ill patients. You can see um, the first two studies and the last study are the randomized controlled trials. These two studies are comparatives of different, um, different treatment regimens. But you can see um, a high proportion of them are septic. Um, more than 70% of the patients were ventilated with a patchy two score somewhere around 25 to 30. So these are acutely ill patients, um, most of them on vasopressors. And yet, despite that, they showed no difference between PD and, acute, and extracorporeal therapy. So yes, you can use it in a critical care environment. And we weren't the only ones who, who recommended it. There's a Cochrane review that also says, based on moderate level of evidence for mortality and recovery of kidney function, um, and that there's probably little or no difference between PD and extracorporeal therapy for treating AKI. Real world outcomes, Fred's talked to you about our Saving and Life program, and this is our data that we've got um, in hand of 408 um, children and some adults treated with AKI with a 60% survival. And this is in very low resource environments where patients are often presenting extremely late and, and yet very good outcomes um, for that. The next question was, what is the optimal access and fluid delivery for PD and AKI? Now, if you're doing acute PD, you want to get good flow volumes. You're using a lot of fluid, and that fluid needs to flow in and out very rapidly. If you're spending a lot of time draining in and draining out, there's not much fluid in the abdomen to actually be dwelling and equilibrating with the blood. So you want a catheter that's going to allow rapid flow. And unfortunately, rigid catheters are more prone to blockage. They tend to leak, and there is a higher incidence of peritonitis. So we prefer catheters that, that, that aren't the same as the rigid um, stick catheters. Um, also, these catheters tend to have a high complication rate, which means that you have to change these catheters. They might have peritonitis. So the cost saving of a rigid catheter might not actually um, be real because these patients have higher costs for other reasons. But skills vary between centers, and so you've got to use what you know best and what's going to save lives. So our guidelines recommend as, a, as the optimal that flexible PD catheters should be used where these resources and expertise exist and putting in a Tenkov catheter uh, is what we would recommend. But a minimum standard, and this has certainly been shown around the world to save lives, 
is that we can use rigid catheters, and this is predominantly used in, in South and Southeast Asia, where they are very effective, and certainly it was what I learned to, to do acute PD with. Um, and you, even if you don't have a rigid catheter, you can use other um, cavity drainage catheters. Um, this child here is a nasogastric tube, which has had side holes cut in it, and this was an intercostal drain I had to use at one point because we had no other catheters available. So anything which allows fluid to drain in and drain out is suitable. We recommend that the catheters should be tunneled to reduce peritonitis and pericatheter leak. This is a practice point, this is opinion based, but it is often easier to nurse a patient who has a tunneled catheter in. This is not the same for children and there's going to be another um, ISPD webinar talking about PD for pediatrics. So I'm talking predominantly about adults here. We recommend that the catheter implantation is based on patient factors and locally available skills. And this is because some people may not know how to put in a tank of catheter and we'd rather you put in something that you know how to use appropriately. We do recommend that nephrologists put in PD catheters. And this is very important because in many low resource centers, the surgeons do not support nephrologists putting in PD catheters. They feel that it's a surgical procedure and they don't offer support. So we strongly recommend that the nephrologists are able to put them in. And the reason for this is that if the nephrologist is putting the PD catheter in, often you can get the PD catheter in much quicker. You don't have to wait for theater time. You don't have to find an anesthetist who doesn't want to put the patient to sleep because their potassium is greater than six. And so you're able to get the patients onto dialysis much quicker than if you wait in most cases for a surgical team to do it. Um, we recommend that you put your PD catheters in the most aseptic um, method as possible. We don't want these patients getting um, peritonitis. Um, it, there is good evidence that you should um, put antibiotic, give the patients antibiotics prior to putting the PD catheter in to prevent peritonitis. We also recommend that you use a closed delivery system. So like a twin bag or an APD machine is the ideal because it's a closed system, you're much less likely to have touch contamination and cause peritonitis. However, this is not going to be feasible in many low resource settings. And so you can use systems where you spike bags um, or use three-way taps to, to allow fluid to drain in and drain out. And we do uh, suggest that automated PD might be a good option to prevent peritonitis, but there's no evidence for this. Um, it, it makes sense. Um, but certainly it, it is not a, a requirement for doing acute PD. This is just a meta-analysis looking at percutaneous catheter insertion versus surgical insertion. Um, this is based on very heterogeneous studies that you can see putting in PD catheters at the bedside um, is certainly not inferior to surgically inserted catheters um, from a one-year catheter survival. And a second meta-analysis shows the same, and there's good evidence from around the world showing that putting in catheters at the bedside gives as good an outcome as surgically placed catheters. And so we should support um, nephrologists or um, nurses to be putting in PD catheters at the bedsides to save lives. I just urge you to go and have a look at these guidelines. It's another set of guidelines um, on creating and maintaining optimal peritoneal dialysis access, um, which we updated in 2019. But this is, gives a good idea of how to put PD catheters in and best practice at looking after them. The next question is which fluids should we use and what do we do when these are not available? So we do recommend that you use commercially produced solutions. And this is because these are, are produced to a high quality standard. They're unlikely to have contamination um, and you're less likely to get peritonitis. But where resources do not permit, we do recommend that you can use locally prepared solutions, as long as you do it in the most careful, sterile environment that you can to try and prevent peritonitis. And this is the minimum standard for that. Once the potassium levels in the serum fall below four, um, we recommend that you add potassium to the bags to maintain four millimoles per litre in the solution. And the reason is that acute PD often drops the potassium very rapidly. And if you have no potassium in the solution, these patients can become hypokalemic. And this is especially a problem in the ICU where patients are prone to arrhythmias. If you don't have facilities to measure potassium, it's probably going to be normalized within 24 hours of good acute PD using the volumes I'm going to talk about later. 
So from that point onwards, using a concentration of four millimoles per liter in the solution um, is, or adding potassium at that point is probably reasonable. Remember, we're dialyzing these patients against the dialysate. So you shouldn't increase the potassium above four millimoles because you're looking at equilibration. So adding potassium to the solution is not going to add to their serum potassium. So if we look at what commercially available IV fluids we have, most of us will have options of either Hartman solution, Ringer's lactate or Plasmalite B. And you can see most of them have a sodium of 131. All of them have potassium and that's really important to, to note um, that potassium varies in different countries. Um, Ringer's lactate and Hartman's has some calcium in it. The chloride is about 111 and they have a buffer either being lactate um, in Ringer's and Hartman's or bicarbonate and plasmalite B. But you can see that their osmolality is quite low or normal. If you look at the commercially available PD solutions, so that's um, both the, the dineal and the balance or Bicavera solutions, you can see that the sodium, the calcium, the chloride and the buffers are actually very similar. So if you're going to make a solution, all you have to really do is change the osmolality. And in the guidelines, there is a recipe for um, how you can make up a solution um, for these patients. So if you've got Ringer's lactate and you add 30 mils of 50% dextrose, you'll make about a 1.5% solution. If you add 90 mils of 50% dextrose, you'll make a 4.5% solution. And obviously, if you add 60, you're going to get halfway in between. So it's very easy to make up your own solutions. Some people would rather not do that because these solutions all contain some potassium in. So if you've got a patient who's got a very high potassium, you can use one of the alternatives um, to make an a, a appropriate solution. Now, we were concerned about recommending um, mixing your own solutions because we thought that these patients were going to get peritonitis if we suggested this. And I'm glad to say that that doesn't appear to be the case if it's done carefully. So this is one of the Saving Young Live sites in Bimbingo, and Fred's talked about this. They looked at the, the commercial solution patients. Those were the ones that um, initially were supplied with solutions by Saving Young Lives. And once that stopped, they then started making their own solutions using Ringer's lactate and glucose. And you can see peritonitis rates um, were no different between the two groups um, when they mixed their own solutions. And that's been confirmed in two other studies. The first from Minya McCulloch in Cape Town in the Red Cross Children's Hospital where they had two cases of peritonitis out of 50 patients. And as Fred's um, paper from, showed you the paper from um, Democratic Republic of Congo, again, in a uh, very low resource setting, um, these patients, they had two patients out of 32 had peritonitis. And that's what we would expect to see even using um, the, the normal commercially produced solutions. The next question is, how do we dose PD for AKI? And this is uh, quite a, or has been quite a tricky topic and certainly was when we started out in the 2015 guidelines because there was no, there was really no guidance of what we should be doing. So in 2015, we took what was the, the best we had at the time and that was that we recommended a weekly KT of B of urea of 3.5. And the reason for that was that there was the one study from Daniel Lepons from, from Brazil showing that outcomes using that KTOV were equivalent of daily hemodialysis. So we had outcome data showing that that dose was acceptable. But when we extrapolated from extracorporeal studies, we thought that actually a KTOV of about 2.1 might be appropriate. So you can see we had a 2D or opinion-based recommendation that that a KTOV of 2.1 might be acceptable. And I'll talk about in a minute why we suggested a lower target. I'm glad to say that in 2020, we have a better, a better idea of, um, of, of what we should be aiming for. So we still say that you can target a KTOV of 3.5, especially in critically ill patients. Um, and certainly you're going to get outcomes that are similar to extracorporeal therapies. But we have evidence now actually confirmed that aiming for a lower KTOV of 2.2 actually gives equivalent outcomes to those aiming for higher doses. And I'll talk about it in a minute. But also, we have the study from Abdullah Lawesh looking at tidal APD using 25 liters of fluid, 70% tidal volume. There is not a, a KTOV, a but showing um, that you get equivalent outcomes compared to CVVHDF. 
So what are we hoping to achieve? How do we, how do we decide how we're going to dose the patient? How are we going to decide what our initial prescription is going to be? Well, these patients generally are presenting hyperkalemic, acidotic, and fluid overloaded. And that's what's going to kill our patient in the first 24, 48 hours. So we need to correct that very quickly. Now you do that by rapid cycling and you get rid of fluid with high glucose concentrations. So that's what we need to achieve to save our patients' lives. Certainly patients don't die from a, a high creatinine um, or a high phosphate necessarily. But once we've corrected those, those problems, we then need to look at removing middle molecules. Remember these patients are critically ill patients and they often have, have a lot of cytokine um, and, and other inflammatory soup floating around. So we need to look at how do we, how do we actually get rid of those. And these larger molecules need time and they need fluid removal um, for convection to remove these middle molecules. We also want to maintain a neutral fluid balance once the patient's resuscitated. So if a patient comes in fluid deplete, sure, give them fluid, but once they've had their fluid, they need to be maintained in neutral fluid balance. So we need to adjust their glucose concentration appropriately. Now these are just two pictures, just to, to give you an idea of, of you know, why I suggest what, we, what I do. So in the, the top picture, you can see that patients equilibrate small molecules very rapidly in the first one to two hours. So things like potassium, hydrogen ions are going to equilibrate very rapidly, but larger molecules like phosphate and beta 2 microglobulin need time. They need, uh, they've got a, a, a very um, gradual slope. So longer dwells are better for those larger molecules. And the bottom one, I've actually stretched out a, a, a fluid um, equilibration slide showing ultrafiltration using a, a, a 3.8, sorry, a 4.25 percent bag. And you can see again in the first two hours you get rapid fluid removal, and then you lose that that fluid removal over time. So that's why we recommend that in that first one to two hours. That's when you're going to get optimal clearance of, of fluid and, and small molecules. But then you need to move to longer dwells once you've corrected that. So we say that cycle times would be dictated by the circumstances, short cycle times, one to two hours to correct those um, killers, and then move to four to six hourly dwells once these are controlled. And this will reduce both cost, but might also get rid of larger size of solutes at that point. And make sure your concentration of dextrose is, is appropriate. And don't be scared of using glucose. In chronic PD, we don't want to use high concentration glucose bags because that damages the peritoneum over time. In these patients, removing fluid and convection are actually really important. And so we certainly can use higher concentration glucose solutions. What is really important though, is that you maintain the serum, dex, the serum glucose in the appropriate range by using insulin um, and a sliding scale, for example to make sure that they, that they don't become hyperglycemic as a result. So as I say, when we first produced the guidelines, there wasn't much guidance as to how much fluid should we use. And there were, there's all these studies that used anywhere between 13 and 70 liters a day of, of PD fluid. So we had to look at, at outcome data. So the first study was Gabriela Ponce's, um, so Daniela Ponce's study from um, Brazil. And you can see they achieved a weekly KTFV of 3.85, um, which is sorry, which is a, a, a great clearance, and certainly maybe more than what we would need for um, if we compared it to extracorporeal therapy. So you can see on the right there's a, a standardized equilibration curve, um, standardized KTFV curve, and in extracorporeal studies looking at CVVHDF and daily hemodialysis from um, the NIH studies as well as the ANS data studies, they achieved a weekly KTFV of 2.1, so significantly lower than what was achieved in Brazil. But they showed good outcomes with that, and that appeared to be the minimum level that we should aim for. But in PD, we only had this KTFV of 3.85. So Certainly, you get survival equivalent to daily intermittent hemodialysis achieving these sorts of clearances. The group in Brazil then went on to look and see what about if we aim for even higher targets. So they looked at a weekly KTV of 4.13, which was achieved, or a KTV of 3, and they showed no difference in 30 day mortality when they aimed even higher. So it seems like the lower threshold at this point is around about 3. 
The problem is that it, to, in order to achieve that, they were using 36 to 48 liters of fluid a day. Um, and in most low resource centers, that is not achievable. And especially if you're doing a manual PD, you're not going to be able to achieve that. But we must remember that when we're doing PD, when the fluid's draining in and draining out, we don't really have great dialysis because the fluid's not in contact with the peritoneum. So our dwell time is important as well. So if you do a, a, a cycle every hour, you're going to use 48 liters of fluid in a day if you're doing two liter dwells. And your dialysis time or your dwell time is actually going to be 12 hours because half an hour spent, uh, half an hour spent draining in and, and draining out. So only half of it is dwell time. If you go to two hourly cycles, you'll use half the volume of fluid and yet you'll actually have a, achieve a larger dwell time. So that's why we're looking more towards using two hourly cycles rather than the shorter, the shorter cycles, unless you have you know, life-threatening hyperkalemia or life-threatening fluid overload that you really need to achieve or clear. So after our, our guidelines in 2015, uh, Watsanya Parapagun in Thailand actually randomized patients to the high target and the low target that we had recommended. And you can see that the intensive group, which was targeting KTV of 3.5, and they achieved a KTV of 3.3, and the minimal um, group achieved a KTV of 2.26. And there was actually no difference in mortality. If anything, mortality was slightly higher in the intensive group compared to the minimal group. So that gives us reassurance that targeting that, that KTV of 2.1, which is what is achieved in extracorporeal therapies, may actually be appropriate for acute PD. The same group have gone on to do another study, a smaller study, um, there's a number of um, caveats to the study, but interestingly, they compared patients using this lower dosage PD, a KTV of about 2.2, and they compared that to intermittent hemodialysis, um, and again showed that there was no significant difference in um, hospital mortality, dialysis dependence, um, or hospital length of stay, both um, in the whole group and those that were propensity matched as well, suggesting again this might be appropriate. So. That is one way of looking at it is, is, you know, what about if we aim for a KT over V? A slightly different view on it is, is the study from Saudi Arabia where they used a, a different technique. This was using APD. They used tidal PD. So there's always a volume of fluid that's left in the abdomen. The advantage of this might be that you can improve some of your middle molecule clearance. And it also helps with mechanical problems. And they used a bicarbonate buffered PDs fluid, so they didn't use the standard um, lactate buffered solutions. They used two liter full volumes um, and they used 25 liters over 24 hours. And again, came up with outcomes that were the same as CVVH, and if anything, were slightly better, albeit non, -specific, non um, significant. So, how do you go about it? You have a patient who comes to you, they need acute PD. What are we going to do? So have they got dialysis indications? We know that the old dialysis indications of hyperkalemia, acidosis, and pulmonary edema, which we can't correct, are indications for dialysis. Do you put in a, a flexible PD catheter? Preferably. So the blue lines are the optimal and the orange lines are the minimum standard. So you can use a rigid catheter if you need to. Do the patients have shock or liver failure? If you have bicarbonate buffered solutions, it does correct the acidosis quicker. So rather use those, but most people don't. So you can still use standardized PD solutions. If you don't have commercial solutions, you can make your own solutions. If the patients are less than 60 kilograms, they're going to use one and a half liters for two hour cycles, 60 to 80 kgs, two liters, 120 minute cycles, so two hour cycle, and 80 to 100 kgs, they're going to have to do a slightly more rapid cycle if they're using two liter full volumes. Once their hyperkalemia and acidosis and fluid overloaded are correct, Oh, sorry, are corrected, then you can move on to um, using your longer dwells of four to six hours um, to treat these patients. Brett Finkelstein, um, along with um, John and Claudia Ronco, have put together this paper, which was published this year, and I urge you to look in the, the supplementary um, material where they've actually created a, um, a mathemat mathematical model, but also a very nice um, Excel spreadsheet where you can actually put the patient's weight in and it will give you an idea as to um, what volume of fluid you should use and what cycle times you can you can um, use for these patients. 
So finally, to wrap up, just how do we troubleshoot complications? The patient's on acute PD, how do we treat peritonitis or how do we know that they've got peritonitis? So what we do is we use leukocyte esterase um, urine dipsticks. And if you've got more than two clusters of leukocytes on your dipsticks, it suggests that these patients might have peritonitis. What you then want to do is a two hour dwell and you send that fluid for MCNS looking for white cells, um, more than 100 plus cells, and you want to treat them as per the ISPD infection guidelines. Antibiotic dosing, again, as per these guidelines, but because you're doing rapid cycling, it may be better to actually add the antibiotics to every bag rather than just a single bag during the day where you're having to try and leave the fluid in for six hours. You're not going to be able to do as rapid cycling. Also, if these are ICU patients, beware, they may be co-infected with fungal infections, um, and so you've got to look out for that quite carefully. So these are taken from the ISPD um, guidelines for um, treating infections um, from 2016. And you can see there's very nice dosing guidelines, um, something I keep on my mobile phone and, and refer to very often, um, where you can actually just look at what dose you're going to use on the right-hand panel, what you would use in the continuous solutions. Um, to add to those. What about catheter dysfunction? This is most common um, for patients to suddenly stop dialyzing. And the most common cause is constipation. These patients are acutely ill. They often haven't passed stool for three or four days. So that is the most common reason, but they can have a catheter that kinks. They can get fibrin stuck in it. Um, they can get an amentum that wraps over it or the, ament or the catheter migrates out of the pelvis. An abdominal x-ray is helpful for treating the, if we're distinguishing the causes of this, you can see if the PD catheter has moved out of the pelvis. If it's sitting beautifully in the pelvis and they're not constipated, then think about fibrin, um, and it might be well that these patients just need a flush of their PD catheter. How do we treat it? Well, if they're constipated, a bowel preparation solution that would be used to treat to um, prepare a bowel or colonoscopy is what you need. You need to empty that bowel completely. Um, if they have got fibrin, a 20 ml saline flush is a good idea. Just try and be careful of sucking and aspirating too hard on the syringe because sometimes you can actually aspirate stuff into the, um, into the PD catheter. But gentle aspiration and flushing often will remove fibrin. If that doesn't happen, you can actually put tissue plasminogen and activate it down the, the catheter, um, leave that for an hour, and then aspirate it and try and use the catheter after that. But if this doesn't work, you may have to reposition the catheter, and this can be done putting a guide wire down the catheter um, and exchanging the catheter. What about leaks? Again, these, these um, can occur quite rapidly if you're using the PD catheter straight away, which we usually are. But if the patients are kept in bed, um, even using two liter full volumes, leak is relatively uncommon. Around about 10% of patients will get a leak. Um, and if you can rest them for 24 hours, often that leak goes away. Once the patients start walking around with fluid in the abdomen, that's when they too tend to start leaking. So try and leave them empty if they're going to get, be getting up to mobilize or physiotherapy um, or going to the toilet um, and fill them when they're back in bed. If they do continue to leak after a, um, a rest, you might want to try a lower intraperitoneal full volume, or you could consider putting a first string suture around the exit site um, just to try and um, prevent that leak. Or in pediatrics, tissue glue has been shown to be helpful for, for stopping the leak. So I'm just going to finish off um, just to remind you why are we doing this and why, why the Saving Young Lives program. And this is a, a, just one of the stories of Saving Young Lives. This was a, a patient who presented in Mozambique. One of the, the doctors from Mozambique had been to a Saving Young Lives course in Cape Town had learned how to put a PD catheter in on a pork belly model, actually hadn't learned on a, on a person, went home to find this young girl with severe malaria and acute kidney injury, put the PD catheter in at the bedside, started the young girl on acute PD, and here you can see a photo on the right of her when she um, left hospital, fit and well afterwards. So it's well worth it. It may not be optimal, um, but you can certainly save lives, and I urge you to go out and do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred and Brett, for these amazing talks uh, and for this great review that you, you just gave us. So I think it's more than, than proof that PD can be used for AKI in the various settings that you just mentioned, even in the low and middle income countries and as well in higher 
income countries, as we just see in these recent papers published for the AKI, PD and AKI in COVID pandemic, right? So before we go to the question and answer session, I would like to introduce also Kajiro Kilonzo. He is a nephrologist at the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, Moshi, Tanzania. And he he has a lot of, lot of experience of PD and AKI. Uh, because he works in the in the first center where the Save Young Life Life Lives program were, were was established. I'm sorry. Yeah. So welcome, Kajiro. Welcome aboard, and we would like to to have you to discuss your experience that you have in the in the setting of putting patients in with AKI on PD. So we have some questions from the audience previous our our webinar. And I would like to start with this question related to uh, the management of local production of PD solution for AKI. Once is the main challenge that maybe we will have in the low low sources resources setting, right? So, Kajiro, would you like to comment that for us, please? Low resource setting is also um, quite diverse, and. Uh, uh, obviously, I would like uh, the food, the fluid to be produced locally at the hospital, but in a way um, uh, that the pharmacy involved, that there's QC and so forth. Huh? Uh, but um, uh, you'll find in situations that is might be also be a problem as well, as, as simple as that. So in in, in terms of um, mixing, huh? uh, um, uh, when we talk about all the QC and uh, infection prevention uh, measures. Um, uh, will be ha will have to be under the um, uh, authority of the doctor who is actually doing it there. And then, uh, um, uh, of course, um, uh, local hospitals can develop their own uh, um, uh, local checklist to to try and make sure uh, um, uh, the local mixing is huh, uh, uh, done uh, appropriately huh? uh, and um, uh, with minimal infection risk. So um, there's, there's two ways of, of thinking about it, whether um, uh, make it a little bit more industrialized by using the local pharmacy um, uh, or the hospital pharmacy, or just uh, um, mix mix with the other <laughs> ringa lactate and uh, 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 dextrose. Okay, Brett and Fred, do you have some comments on that as well? Fred, Wait, please sorry, unmute you yourself. Yeah. I think Kijiro's point is well taken. You have to have a very um, tight protocol in place to mix the solutions, but there's a lot of precedent for doing that. And the guidelines that Brett was referring to, there's detailed descriptions on how you can make the solutions using lactated ringens, Hartman solution, normal saline, and bicarbonate, for example. And there are at least, as we mentioned, three publications that have shown that if you make your own solutions, the infection rate is not higher. But Kajiro's point, I think, is very well taken. You have to have a very tight protocol in place and make sure it's done properly. Yeah, I think the other thing is just to to be aware that that you know the, the nurses need to be aware that different different fluids have different concentrations, um, and especially if adding potassium, um, they they need to be aware of what their number of millimoles that they've got in their in their ampules in their setting. Okay, great. We have also some questions related to the man management of hyper hyperglycemia in these patients on PD. Brad, do you have the, the 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 practice of including insulin in the in the bags or not to manage ma manage the the hyperglycemia in these patients? What do you do you recommend? Yeah, I. I, I'm not very keen on 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 using intraperitoneal insulin, mainly mainly because it's very difficult to 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 work out how much they should have. Remember, some of it is it goes through a first pass metabolism through the liver if it's absorbed by by your um, visceral peritoneum. So it it is it is touch and go with patients. Also, in acute PD patients, we don't know what they the blood flow rate is like in the peritoneum, and that will also influence it. So I think it's far safer to run a, a, a sliding scale type insulin regime 
either an insulin infusion or if you're in an ICU um, or a subcutaneous insulin um, if you are in a ward-based environment. Um, we do know that, that patients uh, in ICU, certainly critically ill patients, um, do fare worse if they are hypoglycemic. So tight glycemic control is really important. The other thing is that you need tight glycemic control to get good ultrafiltration because if your blood glucose is high, your gradient is, is much lower. And so um, you need to have that good glycemic control to get good ultrafiltration. Okay. Yeah, I can just add one thing. And when CAPD yeah, yeah. first started, we used to put insulin in the bags routinely, but we found that insulin actually adheres to the plastic in PD mm. bags, and the amount that's absorbed is actually quite variable. So most people have abandoned putting insulin into solutions and much prefer, as Brett mentioned, to use a sliding scale coverage to control the sugar. But controlling the sugar is really important, as Brett mentioned. Okay. So we have also some questions related to the catheter. So we have here a question mentioning about after, right after putting the, the catheter, is, is that okay to start PD directly, directly without any kind of irrig irrig irrigation procedures to flush out the fib fibrin or blood pro products? Do you have some practice related to these flushing catheters or, or even using heparin or other substances to avoid fibrin or, or blood uh, clots on the catheter. Yeah, Julia, yeah, so, do you have some experience or, or yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I, I would really recommend to start immediately. Yeah? Um, um, it, it really helps uh, if there's a little bit of blood or everything just to flush it off. And uh, I, actually, um, uh, we tend to do uh, um, uh, in the first hour, maybe um, four or five exchanges just to uh, make sure the, 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 the flow is there uh, uh, b b b before we go to sleep uh, um, uh, uh, and, and, and continue it <laughs> immediately uh, um, uh, 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 through, throughout the process. So yeah, it, it is helpful to start immediately really. Um, uh, um, uh, there, there is concerns of, of leaking and uh, uh, of course, it depends on what kind of um, uh, method you have used. Uh, but usually, it's not a, a big issue. Uh, particularly, we, we we used to tunnel them. Uh, um, uh, it, it, it is not really a, 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 an issue we have. Uh, uh, we, yeah. Brett would like to comment as well. No, I mean I agree, I agree completely with the Jiro. Um, the I think the tunneling does help. Also, the PD cats are put in at the bedside. Um, I tend to find they, they are less likely to leak than those that are put in by the surgeons. I think they're more used to making slightly bigger bigger cuts than we are. Um, so we don't usually have a major problem with leakage. Um, as I say, just getting up and walking around with fluid in the abdomen does, does make that more likely. In the guidelines, um, certainly in the older guidelines, we did recommend adding heparin to the bags if there's fibrin. Um, and so we would add normally 500 to 1,000 units per liter of, of fluid um, if there is fibrin. And in pediatrics, they recommend that as a routine. Um, we would normally do it just if we, if we noted that there was fibrin in the bags. Um, and don't, don't be worried that if you see a little bit of blood staining in the fluid, um, actually sometimes that's the best time to put heparin in. You're not going to make them bleed more and you're less likely to get that catheter blocking from, from blood and fibrin. But let me just add, from a clinical standpoint, you placed the catheter when you wanted to start the PD. You wouldn't place the catheter a couple of days before, so you would put the catheter in and basically use it right away. I think as Kajiro mentioned. We have also a question here directly to Brett related to, for example, if the nephrologist has access to HD. Um, SLED or acute PD with rigid catheter. What should these nephrologists use in your point of view? Um, yeah, look, I think if, if you have the, if you have the option of, of CRT or SLED, um, you you know that you're going to get good good clearance with that. And you've probably got enough resources that you don't need a rigid catheter. Um, 
so I, I think it's 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 going to be an unusual situation where you do have that. Um, if you've got a patient who is is you know about to to die of their hyperkalemia and fluid overload, um, without a doubt, I would put them onto onto IHD or CRT or SLED, um, because I know that it's going to work straight away. Acute PD does have a bit of a hit and miss. Um, sort of to it, so, you know, sometimes you put the PD catheter and it doesn't work straight away and you might have wasted one or two hours, um, you know, going through the process. So if you've got a patient who is, is moribund, um, and you'll see from most of those studies, they never included patients who had a potassium above 6.5 um, or who were in, you know, flooding pulmonary edema. Those patients would be put on IHD. Um, and so, and that would be my practice. I wouldn't either. Um, in the patient who is presenting, you know, you look like you're about to need to put them on dialysis, the potassium's going up, they're not passing urine. Um, certainly in that situation, I would be very happy putting them on PD. If you don't have the option of IHD, SLED or CRT, PD is a very acceptable and good treatment for these patients. Any other comments? Fred, Kajiru? No, no, I, I agree with what Brett said. Again, but again, important to keep in mind that the studies from Brazil and Saudi Arabia both showed that the duration of AKI is less than the duration of dialysis, mineral replacement therapy, was shorter with PD, which makes a potential advantage for PD, recognizing that extracorporeal therapies carry with it their own complications, hemodynamic instability, for example, exposure of blood to plastic tubing and dialyzers and issues like that. So uh, I think you need to keep that in mind in making a decision about the optimal renal replacement therapy. Okay. I have also another question. Uh, Fred, I would like you to answer this. What strategies can help to reach the goal of the Zero by 25 initiative, especially in low middle income country and in background <laughs> of COVID pandemic? What is your opinion? What do you think? Well, I think we it's a real challenge. I mean, to have yeah. nobody die of, of remediable AKI by 2025 is not going to happen. But the initiative has certainly stimulated the interest in looking at what we can do to reduce that mortality rate. So the things that need to be done are setting up renal replacement therapy programs. And PD has enormous advantages in low resource countries, as Brett and Kajiro sort of have mentioned. So that was a big advantage for PD. Um, but the other thing that we've learned, as I mentioned, was that the number of cases being seen is much lower than we anticipated. So this needs to be linked with educational programs in regional health centers and with village healthcare workers to identify patients with AKI, make sure they're referred to the appropriate center where renal replacement therapy can really be instituted. So I think a lot of the focus now has to be on educational programs in these more remote areas. I mean, I'm sure Kajiro could comment on that, yeah? Yeah, correct, correct. Um, uh, that was um, initially quite uh, a frustration in, 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 in our program. I'm not getting enough, uh, uh, not well, uh, not getting cases. Uh, um, uh, and um, eventually we, we, we did figure out, uh, as you mentioned, that the periphery uh, patients were not being really referred. Now, the reason was um, a multifactorial, as you said, education. Uh, um, uh, they, 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 there is a, already a, a thesis which has is finished showing the level of education among uh, um, Kilimanjaro healthcare workers regarding active kidney injury, and that was um, uh, quite uh, inadequate. So um, uh, one of the interventions we're thinking of is also, yeah, uh, um, training, training in AKI recognition. And uh, um, we also have an, an ongoing intervention program now with uh, 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 with Karen and uh, Huda, uh, who, where, where we are uh, doing that intervention. So we observe and then train and, and then observe again, so a, a, a quasi-experiment where we will figure out how exactly we're going to train uh, the healthcare workers for identification of, of AKI. Yeah? Um, uh, so yeah, so really it, it, it is a problem. Uh, um, uh, you, you really have to couple it and, and the, to, to, to bring the point also, a, a lot of the AKI in, in low and middle income countries is community acquired. 
AKI. So I'm um, uh, focusing on the hospital. Uh, yeah, uh, to, 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 uh, we should be surprised if the, the cases are not so, they are so low. Yeah, so yeah, I can agree. Can I make a, just a comment on that as well? Yeah. Um, yeah. One, one of the things that we've noticed is, yeah, I was was hoping that we would set up a, an acute PD program in every regional or district hospital um, so that patients who arrived in extremis could get their dialysis um, before, because they wouldn't get transferred in time to another hospital. The problem is that with this low, low referral rate, often these smaller hospitals may get one case a year where they're trying to treat patients with acute PD. And I think you ought to be careful that when you're starting up a, a, a service, that it is worth starting slightly with a slightly more centralized service so that you get the numbers, you get used to doing acute PD, and then go out and train those um, in the, the outer districts, rather than trying to set it up in every every center, um, because the numbers will be low, the the, the fluids will will expire, um, and they will lose the enthusiasm. I think that's just a, something I've learned along the way. You're right. We have much more questions, but we are almost at our time. Actually, we are we are almost ten minutes ahead. Um, let me pick one or two more. Can we, you use PD in the setting of acute severe hyponatremia and AKI when you need gradually correct hyponatremia? Brad, do you have experience with that? I mean, um, yeah. Brad, go on, Brad. Yeah. Okay. No, you've but yeah, you've started. Go. I'll just. I, I mean, we've often we've often actually had that problem where you have a patient who presents with a, a sodium of 110. Um, certainly, it's very difficult with an intermittent hemodialysis machine to not correct them too quickly. So, acute PD is actually ideal in that situation. Um, and one of my my favourite cases was a, a chap who presented with a sodium of 108, a creatinine of 2,200, and a urea of 54. Um, and he corrected at, at the ideal 12 millimoles um, per 24 hours um, and, and got better quickly. He, um, I will always remember it. So, so I think for the hyponatremic patient, it, it's ideal. In pediatrics, it's sometimes the other way around. You actually have the patients are, are hypernatremic. Um, they're often very dehydrated and you've got to be careful that you don't correct them too quickly the other direction. Um, and sometimes you need to actually add sodium to the bags um, in the pediatric patients to try and get a bit closer to their, their sodium. Brad? No, no, I agree, I agree with Brad. And again, the sodium will correct with, um, with the concentration of sodium in the bag being somewhere between 132, say, and 140. The sodium will have to come up. Remember, if a patient is volume expanded and hyponatremic, and not making urine, they can't correct their sodium unless they get some type of dialysis and PD in that situation would be ideal for having a slow correction of the sodium, as Brett mentioned. Any comments, Kajiro, would you like to make? Yeah, so um, I find that uh, uh, not a problem. Uh, 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 and particularly, we didn't really have access to that much uh, um, electrolytes by then, yeah? and uh, uh, surprisingly, um, that that was an issue. Uh, but, but when I also look at it, uh, uh, looking at the uh, at, at the osmolarity when somebody comes with a with a urea of fifty, yeah, uh, um, uh, really the correction of the urea we also take it slow as well, even in hemodialysis, and um, uh, 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 the urea protects. Uh, somebody against the uh, um, uh, hyponatremia. So um, uh, I think in, a, in acute dialysis, yes, we, we go slow, and uh, and obviously PD, as I do, as, uh, as as Prof said, uh, um, uh, it, it's, it's it's a slow process and, and probably the ideal. But, but experience-wise, uh, um, uh, I've, I've never really worried about hyponatremia uh, um, uh, in in yeah in children. Uh, but then yeah, because we didn't even have this is certainly nice to deal with. Great, thank you. 
And yeah, one last question. It's regarding again the catheter. So how long the catheter can be can stay in in the in the bad patient's belly to treat AKI in your experiences, guys? Dr. Fred would like to comment that. Yeah, well, the advantage of the cuff catheters, they can stay in indefinitely. It's, it's, it's the catheter to use for PD, both single cuff as well as double cuff catheters. So the advantage of those catheters, they can stay in for a very long period of time. And as the studies from uh, Moshe have showed and from the Saving Our Lives, the average duration of dialysis is somewhere about 10 or 11 days. With the rigid catheters, it's not clear. The longer the catheter stays in, the greater the risk of infection. And in most clinical circumstances, the catheters are taken out by the fifth or sixth day um, sort of maximum because you have a free access from the skin into the abdominal cavity because you don't have cuffs in place. So I think that's one reason why we prefer the cuff catheters as opposed to the rigid catheters. Um, so the rigid catheters have a fixed duration of time where they can stay in before the risk of infection exceeds the benefits of leaving the catheter in place. Kajiro and Brett, you agree? Yeah. So I, I, the other the other problem is that often these patients present very late, and you don't know are they acute or are they chronic. The advantage of it is if you have got a chronic program, you start the patient on a, on the acute dialysis, and you find out they they've got small shrunken kidneys, they can carry on indefinitely with that PD catheter in place. So they're ideal from that perspective. Yeah, I would totally agree with with, with tunnel catheter. Um, uh, it's not 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 an issue. Uh, we, we now with, with these improvised, uh, um, uh, uh, non-tunneled uh, kind of devices. Yeah, seven days was um, my feeling. Yeah? We were stretched to that because after that, uh, they invariably get um, peritonitis or even exit site infection is quite quite common. So I I uh, I, I tend not to. Um, stretch after after that, uh, um, uh, and, and especially if a patient is already showing signs of recovery, uh, I would uh, not stay for for long with it. Uh, yeah, so totally agree. Uh, maybe even, even the the rigid ones, we are we, we, yeah we have stretched up to seven days yeah with them uh, without any problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys so much for your sharing your experience with us. It was great. We will try to address all the other questions that we were, weren't able to discuss here by, by the ISN um, Twitter later on. And thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us. All the best. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.